Okay. So I think it's, according to my clock, it's just half past. So we are going to start the session. So hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce the session, the afternoon session of track A in FSCD. Uh, the title of the session is Grammars, Automata, and Decision Trees. And the first speaker is Rick Erkens, who is going to present uh, work uh, together in collaboration with Maurice Laveau. And the title is Adaptive Nonlinear Pattern Matching Automata. And I'm now going to switch to him so that he can present his talk. All right, so this still works? It's working. Good. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so a good introduction makes the first slide uh, a bit uh, superfluous. So let's get right into it. Uh, the talk uh, that I'm going to give is about syntactic pattern matching for terms, uh, which is extended to sets of terms. And to do that efficiently, um, a generalization of this problem is called term indexing. Uh, we are going to consider one uh, approach to this problem, which is called uh, adaptive pattern matching automata, uh, which is described in this nice paper from uh, 1992. Uh, our paper uh, extends this approach to also be able to deal with nonlinear terms. Uh, the paper focus is mostly about the technical definitions and proving that uh, such an automaton that is uh, generated is correct. Um, however, in this talk, uh, we will only give a couple of brief technical preliminaries. Then we will introduce uh, a notion called consistency automata, which is used to uh, be one intermediate step to introduce adaptive nonlinear pattern matching automata. And when we discuss those, we will uh, talk about some future work. So let's get right into the preliminaries, which are only a few. So we will talk about uh, simple or, or first order terms. We have uh, a set of function symbols and a set of variables. Uh, every function symbol has an arity, which is just a natural number. And then you can generate a set of terms um, with this signature uh, by induction, as we usually do that. Uh, I, I think everyone is familiar with this notion. Um, if we have such a term, then we can also talk about subterms at specific positions. Uh, a position is a list of natural numbers. And we use uh, this notation TP to denote the subterm of T at position P, if this subterm exists. It doesn't need to. Um, for example, if we consider this term f of g of x and y, uh, if we consider that term uh, at the empty position, we get just the term itself. Uh, if we take the subterm at position one, we get the first argument, g of x, etc. You, you get the idea. A, uh, a pattern is a term with a head symbol, or we just say that a pattern is a term that cannot be a variable. Uh, and then we have the root pattern matching problem. Um, so we say that at term t, matches a pattern L. If I can find a substitution that can change the variables uh, such that the, the pattern becomes equal to the uh, term that we are talking about. And we say then that the pattern is smaller than the term uh, that we are talking about. Uh, so here you have four examples. Uh, the F of X and Y uh, as a pattern um, is smaller than the term f of a and b, because we can just substitute x for a and y for b. Um, if we consider the term g of a and b, that is not the case, because the, the function symbols don't match. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see an example with the plus. 
uh, there we can just take uh, zero for x, which works in the uppercase, but in the lowercase it doesn't, because we cannot pick two things for the same uh, same variable. Um, and there we get a crucial distinction for this presentation. Uh, a linear pattern is a pattern uh, where each variable occurs at most once, uh, and then a nonlinear pattern. Um, one variable can uh, occurs uh, multiple times. So let's consider this uh, matching problem, uh, which is very easy to uh, to do for one term. It's, uh, you can even call it trivial if you want. Uh, in the first order setting, you can just check all function symbols, uh, and then you can discover quite quickly that uh, there is a pattern match or not. Uh, this match is not the case because the G and the H don't match. Uh, so that's easy, that's good. Uh, but if you want to find all pattern matches for your specific term in one set, that's, uh, you, you can just naively extend this uh, solution to all patterns. So this was a pattern match, this one is not, and this one is. And then you have the case where uh, F is inspected three times and G is inspected twice. Uh, and we can do better than this, uh, this naive uh, approach. Uh, so this, this problem has been studied a lot in uh, the beginning of the 90s, uh, in the late 80s even. Um, and the generalization of this problem is called the term indexing problem. Um, so as I told, we consider one specific solution to this problem for linear terms, which is called adaptive pattern matching automata. Uh, the solution entails that you take all of your patterns. Uh, for example, if you have the left hand side of a rewrite system uh, and you construct this uh, automaton that you see on the right hand side. Um, and if you want to figure out uh, which patterns match your term, then you can just follow uh, what the automaton tells you uh, to do. Um, each state uh, is labeled with a position. And if you arrive uh, during the evaluation at a state, you want to check uh, what function symbol occurs at that specific position. And depending on that function symbol, you take transitions. Um, you will see more concrete examples uh, during this presentation. Um, where does the word adaptive come from? Well, uh, that means that the positions that uh, occur in those states, they can occur in any top-down order, um, which has to do with uh, this, uh, the way this automaton is uh, generated. Uh, and the nice uh, feature about these uh, automata is that, well, the automaton is de deterministic and in every path, uh, every, every position occurs at most once. So if you follow this automaton, every function symbol is inspected at most once. Um, the, the consequence of this is that your automaton can get very big. Um, but if you have to rewrite a lot of times, or if you have to solve this pattern matching problem many, many, many times, um, then it is very beneficial or, or maybe even crucial to, con to do uh, this, this, this good term uh, indexing approach. Uh, the drawback of this approach is that it only works for linear patterns. Um, and we extended this uh, as I will explain now. So let's talk a bit about consistency checking because most works uh, that were done about this um, pattern matching uh, problem, uh, they said, well, yeah, you, you can just extend any approach uh, for linear patterns to nonlinear patterns by first solving the pattern matching problem for linear terms and then doing the consistency checking, which means the following. If you have some patterns L1 to Ln, uh, for which uh, this term T is a match of all of them, you can just simply remove all of those 
that have some con uh, consistency conflict. Uh, so for example, this f of a and b matches the f of x and x, if, if, if f of x and x was considered as a linear pattern, uh, but it's not a real pattern match because uh, as we said before, this is just a nonlinear pattern match conflict. Um, but uh, if we can resolve these conflicts uh, later, now we can obtain two approaches to uh, correct nonlinear matching, which is you can first remove all inconsistent patterns and then do the linear matching, or you can first do linear matching and then remove all patterns that are inconsistent. Um, and we thought we could get some gain uh, in this situation by uh, constructing a different kind of automaton where you can do the consistency checks and the linear matching uh, as a sort of interleaving style, um, which I'm going to explain later. But let's first consider uh, the consistency checking problem, which we uh, solved as an intermediate step uh, as some kind of term indexing problem. So suppose we are in this situation where we have these patterns on the left-hand side and we also have this term on the right hand side. We can see that this, this, this term matches all of the patterns in a linear style, but um, not all of those patterns uh, are good matches because there may be inconsistencies, uh, which you can solve uh, later. Um, but you can just check this consistency problem for each term individually, like we like we did that before. But this is also still the naive solution. Um, and we propose to build a, a consistency automaton to solve this problem for us uh, in a similar style as the adaptive automaton that we showed before. So how do we do this? We take the pattern set that we started out with. We do some renaming. Uh, we change every variable uh, with uh, a corresponding var variable that has a position label, uh, which are these omegas, omega 1, 2, 3, and omega 1.1. And uh, to, to save the information that we got by throwing away these, these, these linear non-linearity constraints, uh, we also generate a partition for every term. Uh, and in these partitions, we say that uh, the, the same position should occur in the same set. If, uh, two positions occur in the same set in this partition, if they were supposed to be equal, uh, if you did the actual nonlinear matching in the first place. Uh, so we take this set of partitions uh, and not the linear patterns. And from this set of partitions, we generate a consistency automaton. Uh, so let's do this. Um, it looks like this. Um, it's also a tree, uh, tree-like uh, data structure, maybe even a decision tree, if you will. Um, in every state, uh, we put a pair of positions. Uh, that are supposed to be compared if you evaluate a term uh, on that uh, on that state. And uh, the outgoing transitions, uh, they are labeled by check marks or crosses, uh, which denote that subterms at these two positions should be equal or not. And then you can just navigate through this uh, automaton uh, like you like you would expect to. For example, uh, if we consider this term above, the f of uh, 3 times the g of a, then we uh, follow the red trace, uh, the positions uh, at of, uh, the subterms at positions 1 and 2 are equal because we have 2 times the g of a. Uh, at position 2 and 3, we have the same. And at position 1.1, we have a. And at position 2, we have the g of a and they are not equal, so then we end up in a state that is labeled with the set L1, L3, and L4, 
uh, and we can see that those are indeed the patterns that uh, are consistent with this uh, term that we started out with. So that's the first step. Uh, more on these consistency automata, uh, we, we, we studied these things quite extensively uh, in the paper. Uh, we have a correctness proof for the generation of this automaton. Um, uh, and it's quite similar to the construction algorithm that was used for uh, adaptive pattern matching automata. Um, the, the advantage that we have here is that the, the, the positions that you want to compare, they are not restricted by any traversal order. They are still just as arbitrary as the traversal order that you would choose in the uh, pattern matching automaton. Uh, so that's where the similarities lie. Um, also, every consistency check is done at most once. Uh, but again, the automaton can grow exponentially large. Uh, you can quite easily see that in the example that we considered before, because every state has two outgoing transitions and it can blow up quite quickly. Um, the main benefit that we want to achieve with this is that uh, the subterm equality, so the check that you do at every state, uh, this is just a constant time check if you're in a situation where common subterms are shared in memory. So when you compare two subterms, you just compare two pointers, uh, which is just a constant time check, which makes this quite efficient. Um, and you can actually exploit this as we see later. Um, but this is also a quite, uh, quite big assumption. In many settings, this does not really uh, apply, I, I can imagine. So let's let's continue to the uh, adaptive nonlinear pattern matching automata, which is now just uh, a simple combination of these adaptive pattern matching automata and consistency automata, uh, which means um, the states uh, they, they, there are two kinds. In a state, you can either check for a function symbol at a specific position that is in the label of the state. Or you can do a consistency check, uh, which looks uh, as follows. So if you consider, for example, this pattern set, the f of x and x, and the f of g uh, of x twice, uh, then we can uh, consider the automaton that we have here in the slide. Um, Instead of just explaining what this, uh, what this does in detail, let, let's just consider a couple of examples. So if we evaluate this thing on the f of a and b, we follow the following trace. First, we check at the empty position. There we have an f. Then we go to the second state labeled with uh, the pair one and two. We do the consistency check. We see that a is not equal to b. Uh, so we take the uh, X transition, which uh, makes us end up in the state labeled by the empty set. Uh, and indeed, if we consider the pattern set that we started with, uh, there should not be any match at all. Uh, so this is good. Uh, if we evaluate on the G of A, we check at the empty position what happens. There is no outgoing G transition. Um, there is no outgoing not equals transition. So uh, this results immediately in a fail, uh, which means that there are no matching patterns. Uh, if we evaluate on this term, uh, then we end up in the set that contains two patterns. And if we match on the f of a twice, then we see that we fail on the g transition but we can still take the not equals transition, uh, which is taken in any other case, uh, which means that only one pattern matches in this case. So for any pattern set, you can construct this, uh, this automaton. Uh, the construction works like this. I'm not going to explain it like this. Uh, I'm hardly going to explain it at all because maybe I will run out of time a little bit, but we can do uh, a couple of states. 
So suppose we start with uh, this pattern set. Um, then we rename it like we used to, uh, like I showed you before. Um, so we start from uh, this point at some initial state as zero. Uh, we start out with a prefix, uh, which is used as an argument to keep track of what you have seen. Uh, and we use two uh, sets, E and N. E is a partition. Um, and n is uh, just a set of pairs. Uh, e keeps track of what we already know to be equal. n uh, keeps track of what we know not to be equal. Now we can do a couple of states. Um, so I told you that the traversal order is, uh, is a parameter in this uh, algorithm. Uh, it works as follows. We have some selection function that you can feed some set of positions or pairs that still have to be compared. So at this point of the construction, we say, oh, we want to select some thing from this set, uh, but it only contains one thing, the empty position at this point. So we select the empty position, which is always, in this sense, the starting position of your evaluation, which makes sense. Uh, then we check for all function symbols in the pattern set at this position. And we create outgoing transitions for each of those function symbols. There is only one, so we go with an F transition to this S1. Now we do the same thing. Uh, let's see. Now we have more work to select from. So we can either uh, inspect the function symbol at position one, or at position two, or we can decide to do a consistency check between uh, position one and two. Um, this is up to your setting, uh, up to your, uh, your, your uh, preference, uh, depending on what you want. So you can select, for example, the position one, two, and then you get two, uh, then the state is deemed a consistency state and you get two uh, outgoing transitions. So you can unfold this thing a lot more, but I want to go into more uh, more other details. So let's just skip through because I don't have too much time. Um, more about this uh, procedure. Uh, we proved that the construction algorithm is uh, correct. Uh, this is again similar uh, to the construction for adaptive uh, pattern matching automata and the consistency automata that we uh, showed. Uh, again, parameterized in a traversal order uh, with the advantage that every function symbol is checked at most once. Every consistency check is done at most once. Uh, this, of course, results in some heavy, exponentially big automaton, uh, which may not be what you want. But if you have to rewrite a lot of times, this, I think this will be very beneficial. Uh, and this constant time subterm equality, if you have it, you can actually exploit this, as I will show in the next couple of slides. But there are still some optimizations that can be done here, because even with our construction, uh, the automaton can still have uh, a couple of redundancies, uh, as I will explain now. So you saw this consistency automaton before. Um, if you're very observant, uh, as an attendee, even via this digital conference, you may know that um, a term, uh, if you do consider inductively defined terms, a term can never be equal to one of its subterms. So this is the problem that we have here. Um, a term at position one can never be equal to a term at position 1.1. So these states here are actually redundant, which makes the checks redundant as well. If you can detect this, uh, when you construct this thing, you can make a small automaton uh, on the fly. We know how to remove these redundant states, uh, but we don't know how to construct the optimal, the locally optimal automaton uh, on the fly yet, uh, even for co consistency automata. 
if you consider this pattern matching automaton, uh, the example that we considered before, um, we did remove one extra G transition. Uh, so uh, in order to definitely know that the pattern G of uh, F of G and X twice matches, you actually have to observe that G is there twice. But you already know that uh, the subterms at this position are equal. You already check this because of the consistency check. Uh, so you only have to check it once. And this is what I mean by exploiting this thing. But the problem is that we cannot detect this yet or decide this yet at uh, construction time. We can only remove a couple of these things at runtime uh, after, after we constructed the thing. So this is our biggest future work for this, uh, for this thing. We want to optimize uh, to make sure that the locally optimal automaton with respect to one traversal order is actually minimal and has no redundancies. Uh, for this, you have to clarify the relation between nonlinear matching and uh, linear matching. Um, we have some ideas, we are doing that, but we're, I cannot promise anything at the moment. Um, you can talk a lot about these selection functions. They are very important in determining how good your automaton actually performs in theory. Um, you can talk a lot about that, but we did not yet. Uh, of course, there's also the issue with practical performance, uh, because is this nonlinear approach actually worth it? Does your language actually support nonlinear patterns? Uh, those are very important things to consider before even trying to implement this or even looking at this, this, this solution, even though it's theoretically very nice. Um, and we can also look at other term indexing instances like unification or complete pattern matching. Uh, I've also seen that we will this afternoon hear something about uh, a higher order uh, pattern matching uh, index solution. Um, maybe that's a spoiler, but uh, that's something that you can do uh, as well. Uh, this is my last slide, so I propose that we continue to the questions. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for that great talk. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I don't see any questions in, in the, sorry, in the Q&A or in the chat, but people, attendees, if, if you have questions, if you are an attendee, you can raise your hand or put the question in the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, maybe I can ask you one question. I was wondering, because you, you told us several things about uh, how you could make this better by sharing uh, subterms and the optimizations. But could you tell us some, something, do you know something about the overall complexity of the check? Uh, you mean the complexity of the construction procedure or the complexity of uh, checking when so you have automaton? Just if I give you my n left hand sides and the term, can I know something from the sizes of the l's, l1, ln, and t about how how difficult or how long the check will be? Um, if you have the automaton. Um, for the nonlinear patterns, it is known that um, uh, going through this automaton is almost, uh, in most cases, uh, bounded by the size of the longest pattern. But there are some subtleties here because um, when you have multiple matches at the same time, uh, this may blow up a little bit, but it will always be better at least than doing the naive check. Uh, there are some subtleties here, but I did not put the complexity on the slide. There, there are some formula about the sums of the left-hand sides. Uh, we do know the complexity of the consistency automata. Um, it can blow up uh, the, the automaton, but the, the 
the depth of these automata is not that big, but I don't remember the formula. That's something uh, that uh, Maurice knows more about, I think. Uh, so I don't have an answer to this, but okay. it's in the paper. Okay. Uh, when you combine these things, we don't know. Uh, I, I'm not for sure at all. Okay, well, that's that's fine. It's just to to get a bit more information because it's it's easy when you have just one left hand side and one term. But of course, in in your case, it's things are more complicated. Yeah, it's completely trivial. But with big rewrite systems, yeah. it's it's a pain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. I still don't see any hands raised, so I think you were very clear. There are no questions there. 